You could not have shown that to me in the beginning of this meeting. Okay, pay attention. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I, I, I was like, Darren has a whole web page on this browser thing. Anyways, all right. Yeah, okay. I'm not paying attention. All right, so you all can see my screen? Yep. All right, so you all see my terminal? All right. Yep. So, Bash. I'm going to write uh, just a really two, well, one, maybe two simple C functions, right? So where am I? Right. Okay. So then I write the very first simple function. It just hello world, right? The typical like programming textbook. The very first program you write in any language is just something that outputs to the screen. Uh, hello world, right? So I'll write a simple hello world function in C++. Darren can't get out of Vim either. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I have this file called myprog.cpp. So now I'm going to call my C compiler, Tang on my program CPP. Right. And this is going to compile. And that was, and what happened is that it created this file a.out, right, which is the default output executable for most C++ compilers, I think because of something dating back to the old Unix days. All right, so let me just remove that and I'll compile again. All right, so you see a that I was created. So that's our compiled executable code, code, right? So it's not interpreted. So now if I run it, a that out, it's gonna say hello book club, right? So let me go back and just go through line by line what this program does, right? So first thing is pound include iostream. iostream is a library, which I guess is uh, for input output functions, right? Then I say int main. So C++ is strongly typed. So I have a function called main. So any C++ program has to have a function called main, which is the main function, right? And then, so I'm saying my main function is type int, int right? So it returns an integer. And then you have these curly brackets here that, you know, define, you know, the scope of main. And then I say std colon colon c out. Um, so c out is a function in the iostream library but um, it's in the std namespace, right? So I have to use std colon colon c out to get it. And then I have the stream output operator. And then I have the string I want to output to the screen. And I have an end line, a slash end at the end. And then I say return zero, right? So this main function, if everything runs well, is going to output to the screen and then return zero, right? And zero is the universal constant to signify that things ran smoothly, right? So that's what happened there. All right, any questions on that? None? No. I don't get how you're returning a string and zero. I'm not returning a string, I'm printing a string. Like that is side effect. Side so, effect. Yeah, so this is like a print statement. Okay. Cout is, is, is C plus plus's print statement. Okay. So this That's is the side effect it. of the function. Right. Got it. All right. All right. So now I'm going to write. Wait, wait, wait. So if it didn't work, what would have been like outputted, I guess? Um, well, okay. So a lot of things could have happened. It could not compile. Let's see. Yeah, break it. Well, that, that, that should be the easy part. Let's see if I don't do this. All right. So 
you know, you get an error here, right? Um, so, well, there's an infinite number of errors you could make. So you could have compile time errors or you could have runtime errors, right? Um, if, if there was a runtime error, something probably worse would have happened. It would have started running. It would have had a, well, some, well I don't know, I, I shouldn't say anything, but um, sometimes there's like a core dump and all kinds of crazy stuff can happen. Mm -hmm. but, but thankfully that ran. All right, so now I'm gonna write another um, piece of code. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask myself, the user, for a number and then accept that number of strings from the user. Okay. I'm gonna call this my other program. And I'm gonna use iStream again. I'm gonna use another library. String. Vector. Right, so I'm gonna, those, those are the three libraries I'm gonna use. And unlike before, I'm gonna say using namespace std. And that will allow me to not have to type std as I was typing just now, All right? So now I'm gonna go int main. All right? Now I can just type C out without any std colon colon. I'm gonna say, and strings, enter. Put, right, the CN. Right, so that means I need num strings. All right, so all right, so I'm gonna have, so I have a variable called num string. So I, so I have to declare the variable before I use it. Now I'm gonna say while uh, let's say while count is less than num strings. Um, hmm. All right, so I need to store these strings, right? So I'm going to create a vector of strings. Vector string my strings and let me use a string temp. I need an int count. I'm gonna say count equals zero. All right, so every time I read a string, I'm gonna increment count. All right, so now I'm gonna say the end, which is the input function temp, then I'm gonna say my strings push back. Temp. So push back is a function that allows you to append to a vector, right? And then I'm gonna say count plus plus. So plus plus is an, is an operator that increases a variable by one, which is where the name C++ comes from because it's an improvement on C, All right? Now I'm gonna return zero. Is that, should that work? All right, so let me write a for loop. Count equals zero, count less than some strings, count plus plus. Let's say, yeah, it's, um, my strings count. Okay. Should I? All right, so, so I'm going to ask myself for a number. I'm going to accept that number of strings. And then I'm going to print them out to the screen using our for loop, right? So in C++, the format of a for loop 
is you have an initial condition. So this is where you start. Then this is the loop, con the iteration condition, I believe is the term. So this is what you check at the end of every iteration of the loop. And then you have this statement here that tells you what to do at the end, right? So that, that's the syntax for a for loop in C++. Let's see if this compiles. All right, so, sorry, so that compiled. I'm sorry, let me catch up. Is there anything in the chat? Yeah, okay. Um, where am I getting back to? You? All right, so, so, I, so I'll run my a dot out. All right, how many strings am I going to enter? I'm going to enter four. All right, hello, RKDS. All right, everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Right, so, Right, so let me just go over what happened there, right? So this program is a little bit more advanced, well complicated, but it uses two extra libraries, string and vector, right? And I use namespace std, so I avoided having to use std colon colon, right? So uh, no, vector is a templated class. So you can have a vector of string, a vector of integer, a vector of double, or a vector of any object that you create even. Right, so that, that I, I don't know was, 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 is that a, I mean, I call it a pointy bracket. So that's like a template notation. Right, so I feel like this demonstrates like a lot of C++ features, right? You use different types, vectors, is a while loop, a for loop, and at the end it returns zero. All right? Any questions? All right, none? Okay. So let me go to the presentation. All right. So here we go. Let's talk about chapter 25. All right, this zoom bar is always in the most inconvenient location. All right. All right, so what's the point of this chapter, right? Is that the basic premise of this chapter is that sometimes you have to use C++ to get stuff done, right? Because R essentially is slow. Um, so just taking it verbatim from the chapter is when can C++ help the programmer? Um, so he gives three different cases. Uh, loops that can't easily be vectorized because subsequent iterations depend on the previous ones. Um, recursive functions, which involve function calling itself. And then problems that require advanced data structures and algorithms that R doesn't provide. So, yeah, so that happens, right? Okay. All right, so, and how do you actually use C++? Well, um, the best way is the RCPP package. Um, and there are other ways to do it. And, and you could have used C++ before this RCPP package, but this is really neat. And this is what the chapter is about, essentially. It's usage of RCPP and the key functions are CPP function and source CPP, All right? Um, but a brief detour, if you really want to learn RCPP, you go look at this tutorial that Pavitra had linked to in, this, in, in the Slack channel. Um, and I rewatched it this weekend and it, you know, it's good. All right, so how do you use the CPP function? Eh, pretty simple. You just put your whole C++ function in a string and pass it the CPP function, right? So 
this is code. This is our code here. Um, so it, there's a int add. So I can go back and write this function in in R. Right. So uh, our script. SCP. Well, it's in the add. So CPP function. Um, is it int add? Int x, int y, z. Return x plus y plus z. Right. So what happened there is that CPP function would is actually called in source CPP, which we'll talk about later. And that's creating a compiled function. Oh wait, maybe so so, uh, when, so now I can say add, I'll add my three favorite numbers. Right. So there's my app. I can right, I can add special, right? So right, so let me give it a special. Right. So what it did was it created a comp you know, so it did it went through the entire compilation process created a function and exported it for use in our namespace. Uh, let's see. All right. So let me go back to here, right? So, okay. Now, here's an example where that shows like R being slower than C++. So, um, you know, and, and this is in the book. I just changed, I just made the name over both. I, I have Fibonacci R or is, wait, is this in the book or is this from the tutorial? I'm not even, I can't remember which one I saw it in. Um, but yeah, so here I wrote uh, Fibonacci function in R, right? So Fibonacci function, um, what it does is it's a recursive function. So the first Fibonacci value the first two are one, and then every other one is the sum of the previous two, right? So to implement that in R, you say if n is less than two, return n, else return Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two, right? And the C++ version of the function looks very similar, right? With the exception, you know, I just put you know, uh, parentheses, uh, you know, around the return in the R function, right? But because it's C++, I have to say it's a type, I have to say the type of the function and I have to give the type of all the inputs, right? Um, you could write a templated function, but that's way too advanced, right? So let me just, I'll just copy paste this back into, a window here. So I have my Fibonacci R. Um, and I have my Fibonacci C. Right. So this there's a pretty famous example of a function I can take a really long time and it could blow up your memory pretty quickly. So let's do a Fibonacci R, let's see 25. Oh, that's quick. Let's see 30. All right. Might be too full. Right. 
right, so that's not coming back anytime soon. Yeah, so let me find 35. That might be a bad idea as well. Right. Well, each call to the Fibonacci function calls itself twice, basically. Right, so Fibonacci R of 35 took a long time. Fibonacci CPP of 35 is much faster. Right, and in particular, we can just benchmark, is it Fibonacci CPP? Of, uh, let's see. Hmm. What's going on here? Okay, so I know what I'm wanting is, but I am in the business of ignoring warnings. <laughs> so usually benchmark will because garbage collection adds like overhead. Yeah. And so if, it, if every time it runs their garbage collections, uh, it thinks it's like biasing the so it's just telling you, hey, we can't filter out the Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the median for the C++ C++ version is 4.71 milliseconds, whereas the, C, the R function takes more than a second, right? So fast improvement in performance. But of course, you know, calculating Fibonacci numbers is not particularly practical. No, I don't know. All right, so then, then there's source CPP. Um, which is what you would write in a more practical, in, in a situation where you have multiple C++ functions, what you would do is you would, um, you would write a C++ file and you would include at the top. So similarly to how my previous uh, C++ code had the includes at the top, you would include rcpp.h and you would be using namespace rcpp and that will give you access to different names uh, for uh, object types that are defined within the RCPP library. And then to export the functions before every C++ function that you want to export, you add this, this statement here. Now the slash slash in C++ is, C++ is one of, is, is C++'s uh, most common def uh, commenting mechanism. So if you wanna write a comment in a C++ code, put it after slash slash. C++ also allows you to have write multi-line comments with a slash asterisk and then ending with an asterisk slash. So we put this in, right? So in our studio, we can go file, new file, C++ file. And the default, the, you know, the default RCPP file has a function called times two which takes a numeric vector. So again, it's a C++ file. So numeric vector is a type that's defined in RCPP. We use it in namespace RCPP and it, it returns X by two, right? So I can name this uh, plus two. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean times, times nine. Right. Right, my source this. I give it a name. Times nine forty two. Right. Times nine by twelve, one oh eight. Right. That is aligned with my, I, I believe you can use two namespaces at the same time. Um, well, let's see. Uh, 
Um, well, I don't know of a name that clashes. Yeah, so. No, okay, if it clashes, it'll just choose whichever the most recent one was. That's my guess. Um, but I'm pretty sure, like, if it was problematic, the compiler would have, would have stopped me from, you know, from, from running it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know the collision. I don't know how names, you know, how, how, how collision gets handled. Can, can you benchmark your times nine 42 versus just typing in 42 times nine? <laughs> sure. All right, so, all right, so, uh, so, all right, so that's nano versus, no, 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 all right, so micro. So my function is microseconds and the built-in is nanoseconds, right? So the built-in is faster. Good. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Because it goes straight to C, right? That's why. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that is sure. I mean, we can We shouldn't be able to beat like multiplication. <laughs> <laughs> and, all right. So using source CPP. So, so what source CPP does is it takes an entire file name and it compiles it and it exports all the functions in there. That have that are preceded by this RCPP export, right? Um, although I don't actually use RCPP in that example, but let's just pretend I did. All right, so that code there actually used numeric vector, right? So now C++ is strongly typed. So you know it's not like R where like you can change the type for every statement or whatever. So when you write in code at the C++ level, you have to specify, you know, if you're using a vector of integers, you have to use integer vector for Booleans, logical vector, characters, character vector, et cetera, where it actually has to correspond to the data. And, you know, the, the, the strong type is one of the things that makes C++ faster. Right, so all these are classes, uh, are classes that RCPP provides. All right, so it's just me copy pasting an example. Here's our mean C function. When I benchmark this, this actually turned out to be faster than the native, right? So what he does is, is a mean C takes a numeric vector. The N is X dot size. So that's a, that's a method that numeric vector provides. Yeah, you set your double, set your total to zero and then iterate through it in this for loop adding you know, a total plus each one. And then the mean is the total divided by the number of elements and benchmarked it. So let me, I can go back to our studio. Where is my entire script? What happened there? Oh, I didn't um, add the CPP function. All right, so again, it's a little time compilation going on in the back there. So like, I think if I go in my terminal, right? So my terminal here should be reflecting, I believe all the compilation, let me see. How do I? No, that didn't happen. All right. 
No, I guess it doesn't go to the terminal. Wait, but if I, let's see if this doesn't compile. It should not compile. Okay, so all my, all my compilation errors would go to the console. All right, so, so if your code works, it, it, you know, it works silently. But if you generate an error, you'll see the output from the compiler. Right, so our studio is calling my C++ compiler, Clang++, and it's failing. And that's because in this C++ function, I use a variable total zero, which isn't actually defined. So I can name it total, because I have total defined here. Right, and that works. All right, so now I run the benchmark. All right, so this is close, but mean C, the one from the book that I copy pasted, is slightly faster than the built in mean. Can, can you type in a mean C of NA? Um, of, um, I, I'm, I'm just curious what of, if it of, errors of, if it just at N A. Um, yeah. Or okay. Well, yeah, I should. What? Well. So turn it outside the benchmark just to see uh, what the result will be. Because I think we get the same. Well, I guess it'll be N A, right? If it, because benchmark will, unless you tell it that you wanted to ignore the result types or the results, it should always have the same. So yeah. Well, I, I guess I was just surprised that the C function handles in yeah. um, Well, so it's it's really the numeric vector. It's it's really the numeric vector class that's handling the NAs. So um, if, getting, if there was a scalar, it wouldn't work like that, right? Like if you just put integer x or yeah, like double x or int x or double x, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's also trivial to take the oh, yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all right. I, I won't go down that route. Yes. Sorry. But, so, so RCPP internally handles some of that. Yeah, I think it's the definition. The numeric vectors is 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 defined to like handle those things. Right. All right. And this was what I just ran. All right, so I won't go too much into this. This is in the book. I don't know if anybody has a question. Um, RCPP also has types of the following R entities, list, data frame, function. And also for attributes, the attributes of an R object can be classified using the, the dot atra method of the corresponding RCPP object. So, in this code again, straight from the book. Um, so here's a function, a trips that, that sets, wait, so it's, it's of type numeric vector. It creates an output vector with numbers one, two, three, and it sets the name, it sets the attributes to be, well, so it creates names. A, B, C, and then my value attribute class. What is this doing? Let's see. It seems like it might be hard to write one of these functions that's like more dynamic and like takes a kind of arbitrary vector length. Input. Uh, well, I guess it depends on the use case. Yeah. And doesn't that mean 
mean C function taken an arbitrary length? Yeah, yeah, but I mean like uh, this one, this new mode after uh, Okay, so yeah, I gotta go back to where's my sim card? Okay, let, let me put this in here. Looking at Stack Overflow, it seems like there is a an extension to RCPP RCPP eleven that has a dots class that'll let, let you do that. Okay. Pass dots. All right. So, all right. So what it did was, it, right, so what this code did was assign some names, you know, so take a vector and made it a named vector. Well, it created a vector, assign some names it, and assign these two attributes. My and class. Yeah, compiler options are scary. All right, so that's attributes. Um, missing values. Um, I'm going to gloss over this. I, mean, I don't know if you're going to come back to it. Um, but any corresponds to a different C constant for each underlying type. So here's some code um, that. I was able to run before, but for some reason it wasn't knitting in this presentation as is. So I had to put it in CPP function. So what it does is it returns a list of the different NA values. So in, in our CPP language, if you're using an integer, you have to say NA underscore integer. If you're using a Boolean, you have to say NA underscore logical, NA underscore real. So they all, you know, in, in, in C++, it's not just one NA value. Each of them is a different defined constant. All right, so I'm gonna click next here. And then, and then yeah, and well, vectors are using the same, right? So it's again, again, you have to use, you know, if you're dealing in C++, you have to use a, any appropriate for the type that you're using, right? All right, so next thing is the standard template library, which I think is, is really where it's like C++ gets useful. So what is the STL? Um, it's a really extensive C++, C++ software library, and it has four components, algorithms, containers, containers like data structures, functions, and iterators. And this is not exactly the same thing as the C++ standard library. So the C++ standard library is the set of um, libraries that are defined in the ISO standard. So unlike R, so R is like an implementation. So R, I guess our core releases R, right? But C++, they have, a, they have a committee and they have meetings and whatever, and they come up with what the standard should look like. And then all the compiler writers go and write a compiler that will hopefully adhere to the standard, right? So Microsoft has a compiler, Clang has a compiler, um, you know, there's a, you know, the GNU compiler, Intel has a compiler, et cetera, right? So C++ is defined in terms of a standard. And to be standard compliant, you have to include the C++ standard library, which is not the same as the STL. Exactly. All right, but if you really want to learn the STL, I would say go learn it from STL. Um, this guy, his initials are also STL. And I, in another time in my life, I actually looked at this entire series of videos and I thought it was very clear. So if you really want to learn the STL, go look at these videos, I recommend it. Okay, then one of the most useful things of iterators. So iterators are one of the most useful uh, components of the STL. So it kind of generalizes. So, well, what does it generalize? Well, so, okay, so the, let me stick with what the book says. So the key features of iterators are you can advance through them with plus plus. You can get the value they refer to using the asterisk, the dereference. 
and then you can compare it equal equal. Um, right, so plus plus is our standard C plus C, well, going back to C actually, meaning to increase by one. Um, I don't want to talk about pointers now, so let's see if you'll complain or not. And you compare it equal equal, right? So here's an example of an iterator. So where the iterator features come in are basically in this loop here. So I don't know if you remember my loop in the original program I wrote had three conditions, right? So it was an initial condition. So let me go back to it. Right, so here's my loop. So I had a simple, this is my initial condition. This is what you check to see if you have to continue. And this is your increment, right? And this loop is the same structure, right? So it sets the iterator to x dot b. Begin. So each op each iterator has a begin has has a fun has 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 a method begin which returns you know um, I don't want to say a pointer but yeah but it it returns a pointer to the beginning of the iterator and then it's saying go while not equal to the end so while you're not at the end of the list that's what you keep doing the loop and then plus plus it is how you increase, right? So this is actually better code than, than mine. Well, you know, the plus plus instead of, so plus plus can come before or after. There's a slight difference in meaning. So if you were to, um, if you were to, to assign, one of them would increment before the assignment and the other one would increment after the assignment. So, so, you know, here the code says plus plus. So it's iterating through a vector. So from the beginning of the vector, while you're not at the end of the vector, do the following. And each time you increment where you are in the list, right? So I did a sum tree. Um, I ran this with these four numbers. And I got the sum, which is 2215. All right, all right, so the other thing that is highlighted in the book is algorithms, which is another component of the STL, is that the STL has some really well efficiently um, implemented algorithms. And here is some code that creates a function which takes two arguments. Uh, one is a vector of values and the other one is a vector of bricks and locates the bin that each X falls into, right? And why this uses algorithm is because it's using the upper bound function, right? So let me go here. All right, so let me, let me go here. I'm looking for time. All right, so all right, let's see. Okay. So I'm going to export findable two. Find interval two. Let's see. A vector. Let's say my vector is whatever. Let's say two times zero to a hundred point five. Um, and let's see. Um, where I don't put C, three, two, six, five. Let's see if this works. You think this works if it's if they're like different sizes? Oh, 
Well, yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe I should have switched this around. Hmm. Wait, what happened there? Okay. Yeah. Let me switch this around. What did I lose in there? So is that okay? Right. So it's looking for these numbers: two forty-five, ninety-nine, and twenty-one. And these numbers here are telling me, uh, telling us which bucket they're in. Right. So two is in one, which is true. Right. So. Right, so two is in here between zero and five. 45, hmm. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I guess it's in 10. So 45 is in the 45 to 50. 99. Okay, so this is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, right? And then 21, no, yeah. 21 is in one, two, three, four, five, all right? So find interval, finds which bucket or bin each of the values in the first vector is in, in the second vector. I hope that's not the most confusing thing ever. Uh, Darren, do you think this will, I know what you previously talked about the plus plus operator mm -hmm. like before the iterator um, or after, I guess you can put it after. Uh, does that change if you do it for something like this, where you know the upper boundary is defined by dot end, and you're using the condition not equals to dot end? Like, no, I don't think so. I okay, so I don't think so because this plus plus here is strictly dealing with the um, navigation through well the loop and the iterator, so. Like the difference would be if, if I was assigning, so if, if I said A equal plus plus B, and I said A equal B plus plus, both of them would increment B, but one of them, A would get the previous value, whereas um, the other one, A, A will get the new value. But, but we could demonstrate, well, we could prove that so, well, let's see. We could just plus plus. We could switch, right? So this code is iterating through two iterators. What? Oh wait. Oh wait, no, no, no. I how do I stick that in? On your line 36, you have... Wait, 36, you said? Line oh, 36, yeah. yeah. All right. I think you had this as just C before you not a uh, sequence. Oh. Yes. Right. Yeah, so right, so there's a vector. Right? So yeah, so it gets the same output. But let's see... So, oh boy, so let's say int function input um, int a plus plus 
cut it to an E and another function. Export this one. So all right, so now I go read read function of twenty-three, get twenty-four, and other read function twenty-three, you get twenty-three. Right? So in the assignment. If you say E equal plus plus input, they both increment in input, but um, A gets the previous value if you use the input plus plus as opposed to plus plus input. All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna move ahead. Okay, so, um, and then I'm just gonna say, so we use a vector in the very first code that I wrote, right? We use a vector type. We are always pushing strings onto a vector. Um, this, the STL has a ton of very useful data structures, but Hadley has chosen to highlight vector, set, and map. Um, so I'll just say briefly, a set is a data structure that contains a set of unique values. Um, so it's good when you need to identify whether you've seen a value already. It comes in two types, the, you know, the unordered and the, I think I actually have a typo here. I think the default is unordered and it should be ordered set. I, I need to delete this UN here. So it comes in two different types. Um, so the ordered set, you know, you can, it actually, you know, you can index, well, you know, well, it comes in order. And then a map is a data structure that provides a key, you know, key value pairs, which is like what, um, what's called dictionaries in a lot of programming languages, um, you know, Python or maybe a hash, depending on what language you're using. Right, so I don't actually give any examples of that because yeah, I think we're running, yeah, so time-wise to hit about an hour, all right. And then the last thing is how do you use RCPP in a package? Well, two simple steps. Well, three, it's three steps, right? But one in your description file, add these two lines of code. And then in your namespace, make, make sure your namespace includes these two lines, right? And then the third step is to actually write your C++ code, right? And then that's it. I'm at the end. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I have tried to read this book on several occasions and I didn't finish. So um, I'm happy that I got to the end with all of you. Any questions? This just gave me a lot of PTSD from undergraduate classes. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's such a bittersweet feeling. It's like it's over. <laughs> but it also kind of feels like I don't know shit about C++. So. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, where's that book? This is easily, like, one of the chapters that is most relevant to me. And yet. I'll say I had linked a, an RCPP book in the vein of advanced R that could be a potential future book club. That'd be awesome. Um, I'd be interested in that. All right. So, well, nothing else? No questions? How much yeah, time do you spend uh, prepping this? Because this it actually is a lot of material. <laughs> well, OK, yeah, I guess. Um, hmm. Well, I read it like 
not this weekend, but the previous weekend, almost all of it. And then I came back, like actually, uh, I put all the code in over the weekend on Sunday. I just copy pasted all the code into, well, into that notebook that I didn't end up using. Cause I thought, you know, depending on whatever question. And then, yeah, just a couple hours today. Yeah, no, it's a lot of material. So I'm glad you put it all together. It was like really coherent. This was amazing. I, I've been really overwhelmed by this chapter. Now it's almost starting to make sense. Okay. Yeah. So I think I have all the code in this. So, I mean, yeah, it's just there. So if anybody wants, so and that's what yeah, I, I now know what I don't know, which is great. Cause like, that's the first, first place to start. Like I, I know what I don't know. And now I can like sort of like start to like mental model fit it. But yeah, I, uh, probably still out of my programming wheelhouse enough that I have to like read the next book. All right. I'm going to stop sharing.